Hello everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning and good evening to all of you, distinguished delegates, presenters, and participants from SAG member states and other regions around the globe. I'm thankful to all of you for joining us in the SAG webinar on energy saving potential in electric motor using variable frequency drive. My name is Tula Kodal and I'm working here uh, as a research fellow in energy trade at SAG Energy Center, Islamabad. I shall be moderating today's webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, in quest of finding the energy saving opportunities in various sectors of energy usage in South Asia region, this time we have focused on industry process and have organized this webinar. Variable frequency drive is widely used, but with less understood mechanism among many aspirants and industrial professionals. BRD provides an approach for variation of the speed in electric motor and makes the system more efficient because of low starting current, reduction of thermal and mechanical stress on motor, belt, etc. In this webinar, we will try to cover the major aspects starting from its theoretical background to the application side of electric motor and VFD. Our distinguished speaker will highlight the working principle, topology, selection criteria of electric motor as well as VFD. We will be discussing on what is the basis of energy saving in motor system with VFD. Their application and we try to uncover the existing area of energy saving in industrial process with electric drive systems. The participants of today's webinar are from relevant government department, research organization, academia, and industrial sector, mainly from South Asia. Now, it's my pleasure to inform that Mr. Mohammed Naim Malik, the director, and Dr. Shoaib Emma, the deputy director of SAC Energy Center, have also joined us in this webinar. We are very thankful you, sir, for taking our time for your busy schedule to attend this event. I am also extremely grateful to our panel of presenters, Dr. Ganesham Sestra from KVD USA and Dr. Deepak Singh, National Electric Vehicle from Sweden. I thank all of you for accepting our invitation in our webinar. I shall introduce them in detail before the start of your relevant session. Now, I would like to request Dr. Shoy Imbang, Deputy Director, Sagina Center, to deliver a welcome note. Please, sir. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dalaram. Thanks a lot. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Dear participants, presenters of the webinar, friends and colleagues, a very good afternoon. I, on behalf of SAT Energy Center, welcome you all to this webinar on energy savings in the electric motors using variable frequency drive. It's a great honor for me to open the discussion on this important topic for the betterment of the 2 billion people of the region. Dear participant, the SAT Energy Center is a regional institution on energy and a technical arm of SAR organization on energy matters. It's our endeavor to translate the energy vision of SAR leadership into effect as a special purpose vehicle to implement the concept of energy ring in the South Asia. The center started its operation in year 2008. During the last 11 years, the center has initiated and worked a lot to convert the energy challenges into the opportunities and has become the effective SARC institution assisting and recommending the all regional level energy initiatives. Until the center has carried out 150 plus interventions. The reports of these interventions are freely available on center's website. Dear participants, focusing on energy saving in industrial operations, we have organized the today's webinar. Electric motors drive and control various industrial processes. If we see the figure, electric motor systems alone account for 47% of the global electricity consumption. So any measures employed to improve the energy in electric motor systems would have a significant potential in electricity saving. 
variable frequency drive is one mechanism which is in addition to making the system automated also provide an efficient means of energy saving i hope that knowing the benefits of variable frequency drive engineers operators and energy officers are encouraged to apply these with the confidence and achieve the greatest operational savings in industrial processes dear participants in this webinar we have experts from leading manufacturers and industry of industrial drive systems i have i am delighted to achieve, acknowledge the great cooperation and support extended by them even in this hard time of covid-19 at the end i would again thank you all for joining this webinar and shall request you to feel free in expressing your opinion i would like to extend my special thanks to the presenters of the webinar lastly i wish you all a very comfortable learning and knowledge sharing session with these words i declare the session open now i request mr dilaram kudal to take us to the agenda of the webinar thank you thank you sir for your encouraging words highlighting the roles of sac in the center now let's quickly go on to the presentation our first expert is Dr. Deepak Singh, Dr. Singh has been working as an electrical machine specialist for National Electric Vehicle Sweden, where he is responsible for electric part and architecture definition, concept, technology product and selection. He received the MSc technology degree and the DSc technology degree from Aalto University, Finland. His research interest includes measurement and modeling of electric properties of the electrical See, under externally applied stress and multiple finite element modeling of electric machine to study the effect of stress on the core lines. He is also the work that is leader from NEPS for EU Horizon 2020 project and drive mode. Dr. Singh is also involved in actuator development for street by wire and brake by wire for autonomous vehicle. Mr. Singh will be giving a presentation on electric motor, VFD, and air conditioner, and is energy saving potential. The participant, before I hand over the control to Mr. Singh, I would like to inform that you will have the opportunity to ask question to presenters by typing a question or clicking to the raised hand option into the attendees panel of the main window or go to webinar software. You may send us a question at any time during the the presentation we will collect and adjust them during the question answer session at the end of the presentation over to you mr deepak thank you mr tula so let me try and share my screen here So, I hope is it visible now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, you can discuss. But you, so, you can. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Yep. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, in this presentation. Uh, my name is Deepak Singh, and I'm working as an electrical machine specialist here at NEPS in Sweden. So let me start with the introduction to NEPS. What what are our objectives here? And then I will switch on to the main uh, topic of this presentation. NEPS stands for National Electrical Vehicle Sweden. So basically what, what we are is, uh, there was an old automotive company called Saab Automobiles, which went bankrupt in 2012. And the Chinese entrepreneur, Mr. Kai Yuan, purchased the bankrupt company and converted it to electrical vehicle manufacturing. And the reason we exist is because of his vision. Uh, climate change, air pollution, congestion is quite a, a rise in, especially in China, him became being the Chinese origin and 
our operation is mainly focused on on the Chinese market as well. Uh, we have a 70 year old uh, heritage of Saab, uh, Scandinavian design. And recent, uh, recently, uh, we have been uh, purchased by a, a big investment group from China called Evergrande Group. Uh, they are registered in the Fortune 500 companies. Uh, it happened in 2019. And uh, we are a big consortium of uh, companies and partners which are working on the automotive uh, application and plan to launch worldwide uh, by 2025 quite a few variants of cars and NEFS is working with the uh, wheel motor company in UK and we will be launching our product pretty soon probably the end of this year production ready by 2025 so that was the introduction of myself and my company so i will come back to the current topic of the presentation uh, motor and variable frequency drive application so i i have uh, based my application on the hvac uh, heat ventilation and air conditioning application and uh, why why we are looking into this uh, energy saving potential of uh, variable frequency drive system so basically if we, if we take an example of a HVAC system with uh, the old uh, old method uh, that originated around 60s 70s even in the western world is is primarily focused on uh, on off motors for example, a three-phase uh, induction motor, which is line start, and you simply switch it on or off. There was no uh, middle ground between between the uh, top speed and zero speed. So basically, what they did was uh, in, in the HVAC application is uh, to get different modulation for the compressor used in the HVAC system. They use multiple compressor and switched on and off to get different levels of uh, load demand. And this, this on and off modulation draws quite high current, causes mechanical and electrical as well as thermal strain on the on the electrical motor as well as compressor components. And similarly, in the in the fan units, in the HVAC system of a commercial building, uh, you you either operate it at maximum speed and and try to control the airflow by some mechanically actuated vents and valves, which itself is way too inefficient way of controlling airflow so the figure presented here in this figure represents quite nicely what how how is the how is the design and what are the actual loads that is being operated uh, that is in the uh, user cycle so the figure here on on the on the left so the part load Part load utilize uh, how how percentile use in the year. So basically, more than 80% of the application is 50% part load for the whole percentile of the year. And given the old way of operating things, it would have been that we operate always at this high. Uh, peak speed and peak torque. So basically the peak power point and then regulate regulate the compressor pressure as well as airflow. Just basically wasting this whole reason of this orange reason like simply by uh, not controlling the speed. And yeah, uh, this shows that uh, there is a greater potential of energy saving if we have a, ver a very fine modulation or control of the speed of of the electrical motors used in the HVAC system. This can be uh, replicated or commented as if uh, in the other industrial process as well. But uh, HVAC system is a, a, a great example to demonstrate. And the reason why I chose the HVAC system was if, if you try and take the take a very general approach then the 
uses, the torque demand, the type of duty cycles, varies so much that it was very difficult to present anything when you do not take a, one source as an one application as an example. So uh, in the HVAC system, where are the motors being used? It is, it is basically in the compressor where, where you compress the refrigerant or any coolant, which might be water or some other coolant as well. Uh, the another application is for the airflow control, basically in the fans and the blowers used in the air handling units. Uh, and the pumps which circulates the refrigerant and coolant. But uh, in, in the further introduction, I haven't included the pumps in the uh, refrigerant coolant loop because that's a different story compared to the HVAC application. So when we look as a whole, the classification of electric motors, what are, what is, the current trend, what are available in the market. Basically, uh, I have categorized this uh, electric motors based on the technology. Uh, uh, we can divide it into the radial flux machine and axial flux machine. Axial flux machines are recently, well, it, it exists from quite a long time, but uh, recent, uh, recently a lot of attention has been paid to the axial flux machine primarily due to automotive application me being in the automotive market i know quite a lot about a lot of company who are targeting automotive uh, manufacturers with the uh, axial flux product and uh, recent development have made them quite attractive because of their very high torque density but uh, with regard to other industrial application and at work uh, compactness and torque density might not be the selecting criteria or even point of interest because you do not have a uh, space confinement or those specific requirement as we have in the automotive market. So although Excel flux machine is not at the current stage so attractive uh, to the HVAC application or other industrial application, we have, uh, we have uh, on the other hand, uh, radial flux motors, which can be divided into asynchronous and synchronous. Basically, asynchronous means that uh, the synchro uh, rotor of the of the motor will always be out of synchronization with respect to the stator field, the stator magnetic field. But I will I will explain in the next slide. And there are variants of induction motor, which has one rotor, case rotor. And if, if you see the current trend, one rotor probably is uh, an extinct breed of induction motor. Uh, right now, whatever you, whenever you say induction motor, it's almost always a case rotor. And then the, uh, on the synchronous, synchronous machine side, there are, uh, these are the machines in which a uh, rotor rotates in sync with the rotating magnetic field in the stator. And again, there are different variant, permanent magnet, reluct, uh, permanent magnet rotor, reluctance rotor, permanent magnet assisted reluctance rotor. So basically out of all these uh, machine variants, this is, the, this is a very simplified classification. There are, there are quite a lot of other motors as well. But out of this, uh, uh, the main point of interest for us in the HVAC application and other industrial application are the three that I have marked in, in the ovals, case rotor, permanent magnet rotor, and reluctance rotor. So the next step is to uh, discuss the working principle of the motor. So in a very, very basic term, all electrical motors operate by opposing magnetic field, magnetic forces in the air gap. And uh, the stator is the stationary part which gets the uh, magnetic field, a rotating magnetic field by virtue of uh, AC current in the distributed winding, distributed coils, as shown in the figure, uh, as shown in the animation there. And uh, the, the main difference in all the machine type is how do you 
get the field in the rotor. So as, as I introduced different rotor types uh, in the previous slide, in induction motor uh, is the transformation effect which induces induces some uh, voltage, a rotating magnetic field uh, induces some voltage in the stator, stator in the rotor uh, coils, rotor bars, and which in turn uh, uh, the current will circulate in the sorted Rotor, rotor bars and then it will produce the field in the rotor. Uh, permanent magnet, permanent magnet motor, the rotor gets a uh, field from a special material, permanent magnets, as name, sub, na name implies. In the synchronous motor, there are, this is a very conventional one, uh, still used in uh, railways. Uh, the synchronous motor, basically has a coil supplied by a commutator, not a commutator, but probably a, some brush, a DC current supplied into the coil, and it, it creates a static uh, DC field, which interacts with the rotating stator field. In the synchronous reluctance machine and switch reluctance machine, the field from the stator passes through the air gap to the rotor and the interaction is due to the shape effect and the uh, slots in the rotor that produces the interaction and the torque. So the next step is to explain, uh, this might not be so relevant in this case, but uh, in order to select uh, or, or determine or make criteria for selection for electrical motors, you need to know where the losses are, how the efficiency works, you cannot simply say that a 90% efficient motor is very good. Uh, to have an understanding of the selection criteria, to know where the losses occur is also quite important. So the figure here explains what are the losses. Basically the losses are, losses in electrical machine can be categorized into copper loss, iron loss, and mechanical loss. So basically copper loss, uh, losses are where if the current flows in any of the conductors that produces losses, that those are defined as copper losses. In the iron losses, there are uh, due to the hysteresis in the magnetism and circulating current in the uh, steel lamination, you have the eddy currents. And mechanical losses as usual, the friction in the bearings as well as the windage. Windage means the friction due to the turbulent airflow between the very narrow gap of the stator and rotor. And there is another class of losses which is unaccounted. Uh, there are speculation and guesses where these losses occur. People are, uh, researchers are trying to model these losses, but still it's quite uh, in the early phase of research. Those are called additional losses, which is difficult to account for. And usually standards define this to be like about one or one one point five percent. Now, when we compare the te uh, motor technology, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I I'm focusing this comparison uh, between the three motors: induction, permanent magnet, uh, synchronous motor, and synchronous reluctance motor. And basically, my comparison is based on on what's the technical maturity level, what are the efficiency, how reliable are those, and cost, as well as the advanced topics like uh, sensorless control, which is ultimately related to the cost of the, of the unit. If you have uh, many sensors, it will ultimately cost more. Uh, so, uh, an induction motor. Basically, all the application at uh, during the 60s, 70s, where, or even 80s and 90s, uh, where there were very limited controls. Almost all the applications were induction motor, three-phase induction motor, because they are line start motors. You can simply plug into the supply, uh, a three-phase supply, and it will run. You don't need any any specific control for that. So. 
whenever we are talking about the old system and comparing the efficiency, it will almost always be the comparison with the induction motors. So now, uh, what's the level of induction motor? Is what's the maturity level? Is this is the most used industrial motor, and the technology is very very matured. Even the controls are well developed. It has slightly lower efficiency compared to it has lower efficiency compared to permanent magnet uh, permanent magnet motors and and the synchronous reluctance motors because there are quite a bit of losses in the in the rotor wind uh, rotor bars and especially with the VFT application those losses tend to increase. These type of machines are very reliable and robust compared to permanent magnet, which I will explain later on. And uh, given the well-developed manufacturing process and the maturity of the technology, these these motors are really cheap. And because the and it also do not use any rare earth metal, which helps in the in keeping the cost down. And uh, the possibility to implement the sensorless control, uh, it's a sensorless control has been a recent research topic. Yes, it is possible to use in in induction motor. Uh, they use some sort of harmonic injection or, or uh, what is that called? Um, slot harmonic detection to, de to determine the speed of rotation. So yeah, uh, those technologies are still in the infancy and they have been developed. So that was the induction motor, the workhorse of the industry worldwide. Now, uh, the second type of motor is a permanent magnet synchronous motor. It has quite high torque density and it's very much uh, liked and used in the automotive sector. Uh, it has a good technical maturity. The controls are well developed, it's very efficient because there is uh, no con conductors in the rotor. However, for the VFT application, there might be quite high eddy current losses in the permanent magnets. Which might be problematic on itself. Uh, the one drawback that I can say of this motor is it is slightly less reliable because the permanent magnets are very sensitive to heat overcurrent and it will deteriorate over time. So those are the things which makes it less reliable. Uh, these are relatively expensive uh, because of the rare earth, rare earth metal and the price for the rare earth metal fluctuates. So you cannot even make sure uh, the cost and almost all are controlled by only one country, China, so market turbulence is also a big factor there. Uh, possibility to implement sensorless control, and yes, it is relatively easy compared to induction machine and synchronous electric machine to uh, implement the sensorless control in, in the permanent magnet machine, actually. Another thing is this, uh, it cannot line start on its own. It needs an inverter or a specially designed rotor for it to be a line start motor. So basically, you almost always will have the need, require the controller to make it run. So uh, that's why uh, older generation at work unit or industrial process probably would never have used this permanent magnet. The next type is a synchronous reluctance machine. And this is the latest trend in ultra premium efficiency. I think uh, IE5, this is the only motor and that qualifies for IE5. ABB has claimed to have a IE5 standard synchronous reluctance motor. It's quite a, uh, difficult thing to achieve uh, IE5 level. Uh, controls are not very well developed, but fairly developed, and they are, if they're marketing it, then obviously it must have uh, good control then. Uh, high efficiency, no copper loss or magnet loss in the rotor, quite reliable, because you you, you do not have any conductor or losses in the conductor in the rotor when you're comparing to induction induction machine there is no chances of uh, those uh, conductor failures due to overheating 
the only thing I, I would mention uh, in the synchronous electrons machine is the uh, stress that applies on the narrow bridges, narrow ridges at the surface of the rotor. Those are the places where the stress uh, uh, during the high speed rotation might cause some issues. But uh, other than that, if, if that issue has been addressed, it's a very reliable and robust machine. Another disadvantage our point is that it's difficult to implement sensorless control. There a lot of research is being done on this, on this. But uh, to operate a synchronous electrons machine, you must exactly know the rotor position to determine the load angle. So yeah, uh, sensorless control will be difficult, but research is going on. And again, this motor is also not a line start and it's a controller to be operational. So this is uh, the introduction for the uh, different motor type and especially three motor types, which I think is more relevant to the to any industrial process or even the HVAC system. The next step is this uh, VFT variable frequency drive application. Uh, now. Uh, what are the working principle of a VFT? Basically, a VFT transfers the power from the mains to the mains means utility grid to the motor in three steps. First, it rectifies the AC, AC power from uh, grid to DC. And step two is the DC bus bar will smoothen it out, store it. I wouldn't say it's stored, but yeah, smooth it out, receive it, smooth it out, and then make it available for the third phase as an input for the third phase, which is inverter, which in, which inverts the DC to AC by fast switching IGBTs, or that it might be other gates, yeah, other switches. So this is basically the working principle, and based on the products that are available in the market, uh, I can categorize this uh, VFT. I can uh, the VFT classification into two types. One is the multi pulse front end VFTs. And it's it's basically there are <clears throat> the cheapest one or the most simplest one is six pulse VFT as, as you can see in the, the fig figure uh, in the picture in the left corner, left bottom corner. Uh, it's the cheapest and the simplest, which uh, uses six bridge rectifier, six rectifier bridge to convert this uh, input AC into a DC for the DC bus. This is the cheapest and simplest, but worst in the harmonic distortion. Now the harmonic distortion of this this uh, multiples VFTs can be improved by adding on more of these uh, pulse rectifiers, as you can see in the middle picture in this in this slide. But uh, then, uh, if you are adding multiple multiple six pulse rectifiers, then you need to phase shift accordingly. So basically, if you have 12 pulse or 18 pulse, you face it. You have you have two or three of the six pulse VFTs, and then you have to shift it by 30 degree and 20 degree face shift respectively. Uh, now, uh, the last figure that I have presented in this figure uh, in in this slide is a comparison of the harmonic distortion when you have six, 12, and 24 pulse rectifier. It's quite evident that in improving the number, increasing the number of pulse will in, improve the TS or total harmonic distortion. But as you know, the increasing the number of uh, rectifiers will add on to the cost, and then there's there are cost for the other components like the multi-phase transformer that needs to be implemented. So in that case. I think it would be 
cost equivalent or even cost effective to use active front end vft so basically uh, the difference between the pulse multiple pulse and the active front end is that instead of using a rectifier you use icbt switches even to rectify uh, the main advantage of this will be that since the current waveform are monitored continuously you can thereby uh, reduce uh, the total harmonic dis dis distortion significantly by controlling the current waveform now uh, this uh, this monitoring part for the current distortion is only for high uh, low frequency low, low low order harmonics and not for the high order harmonics so we must implement a lcl circuit in order to filter out the high high frequency harmonics now one interesting thing i found out was the power factor for this sort of application not only depends upon the phase shift between the voltage and current it also depends on the total harmonic distortion so you can uh, cost uh, cost it or the angle between voltage and current can be kept near unity with this uh, with this uh, active front end and the total harmonic distortion are also significantly reduced that means it, it also helps significantly in improving the power factor and all these the normal uh, total harmonic distortion and the power, good power factor all this ultimately converts into operational cost because you you, uh, you don't need any filters in there for the uh, for the low frequency harmonics and the power factor uh, good power factor means that your energy bills which is in terms of volt ampere would be lower and you will save money in the operation as well another advantage of this active front end would be that if you implement the regenerative mode like uh, if you have a rotation of the machine and torque in in opposite direction like positive torque and negative direction or negative torque and positive uh, negative direction of rotation and positive torque i don't know if there is any application industrial application or in the s work even any of the use case will have that but in case of uh, automotive application we have quite a lot of regenerative uh, use cases as well so if, if if there is any regenerative power being produced by the motor you can always put it back to the ac mains or the grid which act, again usually will eliminate the need of register bank to dump those regenerative energy and these are the advantages of active front end VFTs and comparing the cost if if uh, if you need to comply with the grid requirement probably six pulse VFT won't be so so good then uh, to comply with them either you have to use the filter or active power factor correction or whatever it is or you have to go to 12 and 18 pulse VFTs which in both the cases will increase the cost in that case then it might be justifiable to use the active front end now with the uh, with the classification of vft done i would like to discuss additional issues that might arise due to the use of vft especially when you are considering to implement it in already existing system so we have to be very uh, careful that uh, VFTs with the pulse switch modulation are switching the voltage waveform or even the current waveform, special voltage, uh, quite fast in, in the range of kilohertz. So that will impose slightly more even copper losses as well as uh, core losses and it is specially affecting the magnet losses in the permanent magnet motor 
So these additional losses need to be taken into account. And what does that mean is that probably you need to oversize the motor for any application so that you don't heat it up so much or you have to have a better cooling way to cool so that those losses would be carried out of the motor. And uh, another thing with the VFT is, is the motor bearing currents. Uh, if you have, if you are having only the line start motor or some other VL, uh, what is that called? Uh, voltage source inverter, current source inverter without PWMs, only simple commutation. Then you might not have so, so much of a high frequency uh, leakage flux passing through through the metal part of the or the casing and the shaft of the rotor, which induces some magnetic fields and some currents in the currents that passes through the uh, bearings. Uh, for the for the high frequency application and especially the this VFTs, the solution is to implement brushes in the uh, bearings. So if your old motor doesn't have the brushes in the bearing and you are trying to implement the VFT, you need to be careful with that. It might uh, the, it might affect the longevity longevity of the bearing, so or might cause dielectric failure of the bearing lubricants. Another thing is the voltage stress, the DVDT in the in the motor insulation. It's it's very important because. Uh, the rate of the insulation classification, whatever we have mentioned in the standard would be for the temperature and DVDT. So basically the amount of, it's not only the, the stress on the insulation is not only due to the voltage across the insulation, it's how fast it is rising. And that uh, affects the life of the insulation quite a bit and might cause the insulation failure as well. So as we are switching very, very fast, so basically the rate of rise of the voltage is quite high in the VFT application. So we, we need to be careful with, with that as well. So basically, uh, I found a term called inverter duty rated motors. So basically what this means is, is your motor inverter duty rated or not, considering this uh, circumstances or, or these effects? So if, if we are trying to implement a VFT in already existing system, we have to be careful in doing that. Now the next topic was to look into the compressor. What types of compressor are available, capacity size and those things. So basically this slides, you can see the compressor type, uh, a typical uh, technical classification. I don't want to go into the detail of it. And the sizes, what are available, different types. That's fine, but uh, what I'm what I'm uh, particularly interested in is the use of VFT in compressors. So basically, I can classify the compressor as, or let's say the application of VFT in compressor as VFT on a fixed capacity compressor and VFT on a variable speed compressor. So if you look into the Edvac Edvac industry, the old Old compressor usually operated with a three-phase three -phase induction motor, which has a very narrow band of operation. So basically 50 hertz for Asian countries and Asian and European and 60 hertz for the North American. So basically 45 to 65 covered the whole range. But this was a very narrow band. So when this uh, Variable frequency drive developed. Those manufacturers starts to started to look into if if they can expand the already existing compressors uh, or expand the frequency band of that. But for that, they had to do quite a bit of uh, testing to ensure that the lubrication and bearings work properly for that. And yes, they expanded those uh, of uh, frequency band for those uh, compressor from. 45, 65 to 3575. But anyway, these applications are not a pure variable speed application, but still some products are still available with this sort of application. 
Now, uh, another type is a dedicated variable speed compressor with VFTs implemented. So each compressor in this type of application appear tuned and optimized with the VFT. Compressor protection, especially with respect to the pressure buildup and and overheating. Uh, and diagnostic feature are built directly into the drive to ensure reliability. And one important thing to be mentioned here is that uh, compressor are usually optimized to be operated at certain very narrow band. And it's made mainly due to bearings and lubrication. So yeah, this type of variable speed compressor have a dedicated lubrication system, might be with use of some oil pumps as well, so that it, ha it has proper lubrication for a broad speed range. So for me, this is uh, probably as, as uh, my topic uh, relates to the VFT implementation in compressor, this is probably the classification I would like to look at in, rather than the typical technical classification of uh, mechanical uh, classification based on the mechanical movements and positive displacement. Uh, uh, now the next thing I would like to discuss now is the retrofitting. That was uh, uh, quite an interesting thing to observe was, is it possible to retrofit VFTs in the old system where it's, uh, uh, there's no speed control, it is always operational at maximum speed and max power. So basically I, I took this topic and tried to evaluate two different types of application. One is a touch like application like commercial and residential building, but in our part of the world, uh, in Southeast Asia, South Asia, it's basically, oh, residential building uh, are small uh, those are not the big residential buildings and lacking a centralized HVAC system so we have a home ac unit so i would like to compare that as well is it possible to retrofit a vft with the into the conventional one so basically in the in the residential building we have to be very the, the two things to look at is our compressor compatible for a variable speed application, especially with lubrication and bearing, and is is the compressor safe with regard to the pressure buildup, overheating, and another interesting fact for the type of refrigerant. So we have to be careful when trying to implement the VFT. There might be that even if your compressor is safe for the pressure buildup and overheating. Oh, let's say uh, the refrigerant might, refrigerant might cause, the, cause the overheating at higher speeds. So we have to be careful with, with regard to the refrigerant type as well. And then uh, with regard to the retrofit, what type of motor is being used? In a big commercial or residential buildings where there are the central HVAC, usually if it is an old system, they will be using a three-phase induction motor as a plug plug and play line start motors. So if it is a three phase motor, then obviously VFT can be implemented, but things to be considered when implementing VFT would be, again, as I, as I discussed in my uh, previous slide, the winding insulation, uh, dB by dt of the winding insulation, bearing currents and cooling. Uh, another important thing to be considered is with the fan motor, it's a low torque application, so we must be careful to select the appropriate size of VFT. It might be that uh, you might be using an oversized VFT for a very small torque application or very small motor, you might be selecting a very big VFT. But the, uh, this is the design consideration that or problem that quite a lot of uh, do-it-yourself group have faced. So anyway, uh, these are the commercial uh, building at work and in the home AC unit, it's a, it's a different beast on itself because 
usually in the in the commercial ac unit either it is due to the propriety of the product or something the compressor are sealed shut but if you find and uh, the motor are incorporated into the same hermetically sealed or whatever it is so uh, it is quite difficult to swap the motor in the compressors but anyway if we look at the if we assume that it's possible to implement the vft then we have to look into the compressor again with the with respect to the comp compatibility with the variable speed application and safety and with regard to motor because it's a it's a single phase application in in the home ac unit so it is possible to implement a, a a VFT in a single phase inductor. Basically, it's a capacitor start or capacitor run induction motor, which is not ideal for a, probably a VFT application. But on the other hand, there are quite a bit of manufacturers which are which are using BLDC, brushless DC. Now, I, I would like to mention a disclaimer here. BLDC is not a DC motor. It's a permanent magnet motor with controller in the package product and can be directly connected to a DC supply. So basically it's a three phase permanent magnet motor with the controller included. So you can directly plug into the DC. So uh, and the figure on the left bottom corner shows such application of the VFT in probably the BLDC motors. And in that case, uh, if you have a BLDC, then in that case, I think in, in your home AC unit, then it's already, it's probably that the variable speed application has already been implemented. So it doesn't make any point of retrofitting the VFT. So these were the uh, consideration that I had when, when looking into the retrofitting of the old systems. So finally, while uh, researching for this presentation and looking into the use cases, I came up to these following con conclusions. Yes, given the con conventional way of uh, utilizing uh, electrical motors in the SVAC application, VFT have a great energy saving uh, potential. And I didn't put any number in here because basically there are different claims by different manufacturers sharing their user stories so there's no consistency in the numbers so it, it it totally depends upon what sort of application it is so but uh, anyway a general uh, thumb of rule is that from 30 to 50 or 60 percent you can save on the an annual energy energy bill so uh, and another thing that I concluded from the VFT control compressor eliminates quite a, eliminates the need of multiple compressor, which is there to modulate the compressor between the full load and part load application. And uh, VFT control fan will also eliminate quite a, quite many, if not all, valves and vents and damper to control the flow rate after you're in the SVAC application. Uh, the thing that I could uh, mention is that active front end VFTs might be cost effective solution, both uh, unit price component component wise or the operational cost compared to the 12 and 18 pulse VFT. This is, this is uh, not based on any hard numbers. It's based on uh, the, the application and benefits that I saw from this uh, when comparing these two active front end and multiple front front end VFTs. So there might be some other hidden costs that I have not accounted for. And finally, for the uh, retrofitting, it's important to mention that not all compressors are designed for variable speed applications. So there must we must be very careful with the retrofitting of the old compressor. Very very careful. It might be unsafe at the end. So again, and uh, another thing is the retrofitting of home AC in it. My conclusion is it might not be feasible given the technical challenges and very limited 
games. Uh, probably the newer newer home units are are already equipped with the VFTs, so it will be easier for newer purchase probably. Yeah, thank you for uh, your attention, and this was this was the end of my presentation. So I will hand over to Mr. Tula. to proceed. Okay, thank you very much, Deepak, for your very informative and interesting presentation. So, we have some questions over here, so let me pick up those questions. So one question is from Pakistan here. For active fund in VRPs, you mentioned that they help handle regenerative power and put it back to the Siemens. Can you explain this concept of damping regenerative power? Concept of damping regenerative power? Yeah. Uh, basically, if you look into the six poles and If you if you look into the multiple system, you you do not have active switches like in the in the active front end to push the power in, in, in into the main supply. Then somewhere somewhere in here at the at the DC DC bus filter, you need to implement a, a register. No, I have, to, I have to look into it actually because dumping register, where are they kept? I have no idea about it actually. So I have another question. Yep. So, but but the basic thing is that you can, you, you, because of the diode, it's the energy flow, you cannot have that into the lines. So you must somehow try to implement a dumping register if, if your motor is regenerating some power. Okay, that is finish your answer, sir? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now another question is, is there uh, any research going to increase the pulse of modulation to reduce the total harming distortion and for the betterment of power factors? Do you know? Uh, with, yes, with regard to, with regard to the P, PWM, okay. Mm. There are quite a bit, but uh, those are mainly related to the power electronics. Probably the active power factor correction. Those those are a research topic in its own. They they, they do the active power correction as a circuitry on itself. Like the, the research is, if you, if you search for active power factor correction, you get a quite a bit of uh, research article that. They have done for the power factor correction in various applications. For example, uh, you can see in here uh, this power factor correction. It's basically they they work on the switching interval, how many pulse per per cycle of switching pulses should be implemented in this Q1 uh, to get a good power factor. That is what my basic knowledge about the power factor correction circuitry is. So basically, yeah, there are quite a bit of uh, research going on. So if you search for that, you could find it actually. Okay, thank you, sir. Now I have another question it's from Nepal. What will be the negatives of VRDs, like introduction of harmonics in AC supply line? Will some special provision on to bring back harmonics to acceptable level? Sorry, I can't. I, I didn't get you. What will be you... the negative? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me repeat it. Mm -hmm. What will be the negatives of BRD like introduction of harmonics in uh, AC supply? Yeah, with the mm -hmm. use of BRD, the harmonics injected to the supply. So, will mm -hmm. some special provision don't bring back to harmonics to acetyl level? Actually. <clears throat> 
if you look if you look into this picture the uh, the lcl circuits that are being used uh, before the input to the rectifier actually these are implemented there to to get the harmonic distortion out from the current waveform so yes uh, a lot of things of, there are different way you can you can do uh, removal of the harmonic distortion uh, distortion if if you are concerned about the distortion in the motor motor side of the or the inverter side of the vft then you can have those in the dc bus bar some filters and usually it is implemented there and then if you are concerned about the harmonic distortion to the ac side then you have the lc filter lcl filter even uh, some what is that called i forgot the actual technical term of it but some bypass filter as well to simply or you can feel, even implement the filter with specific harmonics so that it, it, it dumps dumps it to the ground so yeah, these, these lcl filters that are used in the mains as a input to the rectifier can be implemented to reduce this uh, harmonic distortion okay thank you and there are there are very strict strict grid grid codes I, I don't know if there is any in south asia because i have not read anything from there but here in the eu and uh, north america there are quite strict standards and they are going stronger and stronger every year so yes uh, the work on minimizing the tsd must be very effective to qualify for those uh, grid code okay thank you then i have another question let me do on you with implementing vrb and existing system reduce the motor's life due to voltage stress uh yes but only but if your if your system is designed for to ha handle the voltage stress then it will usually you you design your insulation so that you, first you decide your operation life of the machine is it 10 year 15 year 20 year and then you you decide on the insulation level so basically every motor even if you have designed for it if you operate it long enough it will fail at some the insulation will fail at some point if you are using the VA, uh, vdf or even in a normal application as well because it's, it's certain number of number of times that you can cycle the dvdt and at some point it will it will fail but uh with the current application if you are using an old system old design which haven't considered dvdt variation across the winding insulation then yeah there is a big risk of it being failed okay thank you there is one question uh, can you elaborate more on oversizing vfd oversizing vfd <clears throat> What I had mentioned was if you're oversizing the motor to eliminate the heating, but it was for the retro, or if you're using a VFT in a non-design, but oversizing a VFT, yes. <clears throat> if, you, if you take a 100 kilowatt electrical motor and take a 100 kilowatt rated VFT, you in that case you cannot overload your machine with the same vft because uh, the thermal mass uh, or the mass that is affected by the temperature rise that peak current is very or the op overload current will be very small those silicon uh, silicon chips and it will overheat quite fast so that's why if you if you have a, a use case or an operation so that you you are going to overload your motor by 10 percent 20 percent then you need to have a oversized vft to get to that and there is another 
another application as well where you use one VFD to complete uh, to connect multiple motors. In that case, also it's better to have a have an oversized VFD. Did that answer the question? Yes, sir. Let me ask another question. Uh, so I think in your presentation, uh, I think you did not talk more about what is the rating range of induction and synchronous motor. Can you just give the idea of what range they are available in the market? Synchronous motors? Yeah, both, both motors, induction as well as synchronous. I don't know about the synchronous because it's it's a very limited product. You don't have uh, very much uh, manufacturer who who are producing this, and usually these are uh, quite scalable. So you can order. I don't, I don't know the range of it, but induction motor, yes, you can get from fraction of horsepower to a fraction of a kilowatt to more than hundreds or hundreds of kilowatts so yeah, the, the induction motor range is quite wide you can find it in any of the manufacturer web page what what might be the range of it but it's quite wide and even even the permanent magnets are quite wide on the range but in the synchronous you, you might be limited in the range in the synchronous motor and limited on the supply supplier as well because they are very limited. But uh, sorry that I couldn't give the exact numbers because it is it's a, such, such a wide range of manufacturer and depending upon uh, which part of the world the manufacturer come from, there are different ranges of the product. Okay, uh, thank you, Deepak sir, for your very wonderful presentation. So, I want to make this topic because the bound of time is still the participant. We have some questions from our side regarding uh, energy saving, but uh, in our next section, we are going to cover uh, that uh, from the point of industrial application. So, I hope we'll be uh, cover that. Uh, thank you, Deepak sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now, our second uh, speaker is Dr. Ganesham Sister. Dr. Ganesham Sister joined ABB Corporate Research Center really in 2012. He is senior principal scientist focused on research and development of electrical machine. He has led several technology development projects, which includes glass wayward glass generator to drive train. In creation, he holds several patent as well as publication in leading journals in his trade. Prior to joining ABB, he worked as Geodetic Motion Technologies as a development engineer on megawatt class permanent magnet generator for wind turbine. His interests are in the field of motor topology, drive train in creation and transportation, and industrial electrification. Ganesan Sesta was a PhD degree from Delhi University of Technology, Netherlands, and master degree from University of Sijen, Germany. The topic of Mr. Sesta's presentation includes energy saving potential case studies and application side of electric motor using VRP. Okay, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Tulasi, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so uh, let me uh, head to my presentation. So it was a, uh, like, uh, um, so basically Tulazi has already introduced me, so I don't need to go through this slide. Um, so, but I have put my contact uh, email address and uh, also you can find me in LinkedIn if you want to, if you have any other questions after the presentations are, you, you, so you have my contact uh, email address there, so uh, you can contact me. Um, 
So let me go through like uh, introduction of my co company here where I work for. So uh, ABB, uh, it's a uh, multinational which is headquartered in Swiss Switzerland. And um, just a moment, I need to. Are you seeing my screen here? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. I'm just taking out this. Uh, okay. Okay, that was good. Okay, so um, basically, uh, we operate uh, with four uh, decentralized uh, businesses, uh, which is like electrification, then we have the industrial automation, uh, motion, and the uh, robotics and discrete automation. So, this act as decentralized uh, in, uh, independent businesses within ABB. And you can see like uh, the motors and motors generators and drives, those uh, lie within the motion business, anything that uh, converts uh, does the energy conversion to motion we uh, put it into this motion business and it's pretty big business uh, uh, for ABB so we have a uh, uh, the 2019 revenue on motion itself was uh, 6.5 billion and we have like uh, 20,000 employees um, uh, for the motion business uh, which we operate worldwide uh, Okay, so uh, re regarding the motion business, uh, we are basically globally number one on the uh, in terms of the revenue in the um, motor and also the in, in drives. So both the motors and drives worldwide, we are number one. Um, and uh, so we bring a lot of different technologies, a lot of different products. Um, so it's not only the motor and drive, but uh, a whole value chain that we bring uh, in the motion business. So just to give you a quick insight into the motion business, what we have, as I talked about the value, value chain. So we have basically the electrical motors and the drive, which are the workhorses. Um, um, but then we also have additional digital solutions where like we do the smart sensing of all the components, so, uh, components so including the mechanical transmission. So which is, uh, we have the DOS lines of product where we, also do coupling gearboxes uh, and bearings. So we can get all the digital, uh, we can digitally sense uh, different parameters, uh, including the uh, vibration temperature uh, currents or uh, all those all those different parameters, take it to a ABB cloud where we can do the analytics of all the different components that's used and also the uh, application. Uh, and then we provide uh, diagnostics for uh, diagnos di diagnosis and prognosis for our components. And we also provide, we have also a service arm. So it's basically for the cost, from the customer point of view, it's a total value chain that we provide for motion. Um, so let's go to the presentation part of it. So from the content, so I'll talk a little bit about the industries and application to start with, then talk about how, we, we can save energy um, in this in these different applications. Uh, and after we have done that, we want I want to focus a little bit on the, what are the effects of this VFT uh, on the grid and uh, effects of this VFT on the motor. Um, Deepak uh, G, who spoke before Mr. Deepak, he uh, already talked a little bit about it. Uh, I want to take it a little bit forward and uh, from the industrial application side. So. If you look into the electrical motion, so basically one uh, one third of all the electricity that's used in the world actually is used to convert the electrical energy into a, a mechanical motion. So th it's a lot of energy that's used basically um, uh, by motors to convert this electrical energy to motion. And by 2040, that we it is expected uh, that this the number of motors actually will double in the world. So if that happens, then it is with the current state of art, current, current status quo, what you can expect is that you will be actually adding uh, electricity market a size of China to, to, the, uh, to the world. So that's why I put this point, is it's just to highlight that it's very important that we improve the uh, energy efficiency, uh, especially in this motion business or like when you are converting electricity 
to a motion, we, we really need to improve efficiency. So because it's if it doesn't happen, then we are just adding the generating power or, or the generation units to the generation units and the transmissions uh, um, that's required to support it. So it's very it's key that we improve the efficiency of uh, uh, increase the energy efficiency if we want to be sustainable in the future. So um, when I say, so where are these motion like the conversion taking places in it, and it's in different industries. Uh, so you have a huge number of so like I saw different industries here from ranging from cement, food and beverage, as back systems, as back uh, and as uh, back and refrigeration here. We have marine. Um, so it's a whole lot of industry out there which which use the motion products that are motion products. And one thing is what is interesting and I want to highlight here is like more than 75% of all the applications within these industries are actually either running a fan um, or fan or blower or a pump or a compressor. So basically, even though like if you if you go into the granular details of these industries, then you will see that this uh, basically uh, with the fan, compressors, and pumps, these three units are more than 75% of all the applications, uh, all the applications within these industries. And I want to go into a little bit detail, uh, like, and see, so you, uh, I have like four, uh, four talking about, I'll talk a little about four industries and try to go more granular where they are, what the, what these um, motors and drives do into some granular uh, granular uh, application within these industries. So uh, if you look at the air handling solution, like which is like for used in big buildings, hospitals, malls. Um, so 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 you can see that you have cooling towers, like uh, basically uh, cooling towers, which cool, basically cool the uh, cool the air inside, uh, uh, cool the internal air from the building. Um, and these cooling towers, I mean, th these are basically fans, right? And then you have the chillers. Um, so I, I don't want to go into all the details here, um, but I, I just want to highlight um, highlight the where all these fan pumps and compressors are used here. So you have the chillers, uh, which uses uh, comp which basically are compressors. Then you have this water condensing condensing pumps. Then in, in number four, what you see here is this uh, circulating pumps. So you need to circulate the uh, hot and cold water within the building that then there are the circulating pumps. You have the boilers um, that would uh, require fan uh, also the, uh, to adjust the drives are used to adjust the burner fans there for the boilers. And then you have the air handling units. So which is basically humidifying, dehumidifying, mixing air, cleaning. So just make sure that the air is clean and so these are basically mostly fans. So it's a lot of fan pumps and compressor here. Um, here, this is application. So if you are looking at municipality water supplies or wastewater treatment treatment plants, um, so and depending on which region of the world you are uh, you are there. Um, so basically, there would be like a desalination unit if you were, um, let's say, living in Dubai, for example, like then you to have this water supply before you would bring, you would have this desalination units, which is a lot of different kind of pumps there. Um, and then you have uh, basically, so I think basically what you see is like here is like all, all this, all these different applications uh, you would require like in, at least in the water and water supply would be different kind of pumping systems. Uh, it's either for drinking water purpose, it could be for uh, wastewater treatment. So it's a lot of different kind of pumps that are really used in the industry. Um, next, I want to go to into a dairy processing unit. Uh, so, so if you look into a dairy processing unit, basically, um, so if you are looking into a raw milk handling, then you are basically using pumps to basically um, get them uh, pump the pump the milk, uh, and you have the separation unit which would require centrifuges to separate the milk from your cream. 
Then you have a uh, pasteurization unit there, uh, which is required pump, heat exchanges, and mixtures. Homogenization is used, but like you have pumps to do that. And uh, if you want to produce milk powder, then that's a, a lot of air blowers that's required, like uh, uh, so basically air blowers to um, um, basically dry the dr uh, basically dry the milk. Um, then you have uh, filling and uh, filling and packaging requires uh, conveyor belts there, rollers and uh, conveyor belts, and the, of course the refrigeration is basically most compressors. And then you have um, cleaning, so you need to clean these dairy facilities very often. So you have uh, pumps for there. So I'm just trying to highlight in a granular level what's there inside each of these industries. And the fourth one I have taken as an example here is the grain processing unit. So it's the same thing here. It's a lot of different uh, centrifugal, uh, centrifugal blowers, and you have pans. Uh, so it's it's basically uh, so with all this industry, what you see is like if you do the go into the granular details, it's a lot of pans, pumps, and compressors. That's what I wanted to highlight. Hmm. So now we know that okay these industries now use a lot of these kind of pan pumps and uh, uh, pump pumps and compressors so uh, so how do we save energy by vft so so i want to so the basic principle of saving energy by vft is basically we call it the affinity law so if you take the centrifugal fan pumps and compressors that's used on all these applications they follow us uh, so what you see is like basically the by changing the speed uh, which a variable speed can uh, drive can do you can basically change uh, the power consumption so if you look at the figure that i'm highlighting now basically the flow rate of uh, the flow rate of air or uh, any fluid is in a centrifugal fan pump and compressor is has a linear relation with the flow rate However, in terms of the torque requirement or the head or the pressure, what you can call it torque, uh, head or pressure, it's a quadratic, it's a quadratic uh, relation between that and what with the and the power consumed consumed by this um, fan pump and compressor connected to a motor has basically a cubic relation with the speed. So if you had, if you're speed of your motor that's connected to a fan or a pump is increased 20 percent your flow rate would increase by 20 percent there but actually your your power consumption actually increases by 73 percent so if you so you want to be operating at lower speeds if possible and if the situation allows and we know that most of in most of the cases you never operate things at 100 percent uh, load anyway so so if there is a possibility, then uh, if if there is a possibility of reducing the speed, we should do that. And VFT allows you to do make this uh, uh, change and go to go to a different speed. Whereas a traditional system, you always operate at the same, um, so it's directly connected to the line, and you operate at one speed only. So I talked about the centrifugal fan and pumps, but there are different other types of uh, um, uh, pumps and pumps and blowers and compressors. So in this case, you don't have a, any like uh, a cubic relation, but you have a linear relationship with the uh, linear relationship of the power consumed in uh, with the speed uh, with the speed of your um, prime mover, basically. So here it's basically just a linear. So if you increase your speed by 20%, your flow rate increases by 20%, and your power consumption also increases by 20%. So the, still, it's attractive, but the main attraction for VFT is basically if you have a, a centrifugal fan pumps, which are in majority of cases, it's mainly those uh, majority of these fan and pumps are uh, centrifugal type. So let me give you an, like, just to um, make it a bit, a bit more clear, like. Um, um, on 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 this uh, affinity law. So I, I just want to use the two very basic examples here. So let's assume that you have a, a city, like a small city, like uh, 
water pumping uh, water pumping station where we have three pumps like as, as you see in, see in the picture here and the, the water demand is always changing uh, in, uh, in the city so it's not all the same, same at the time and let's say at a certain time you have 66.6 percent uh, of the total capacity water demand so uh, in that case so for example in that case what you could do if you had a fixed speed system if you had a fixed speed motor uh, and motor directly connected to a line so you would basically switch off one of the motors then you have two pumps running um, so so you'll provide the um, uh, required flow with two motor two, uh, two, uh, two pumps there and your power consumption there is around 66 point so it will be around 66.6 percent um, um, so uh, uh, so because you are operating two motors at the same speed uh, at the at the rated speed if we have a system now if you change to a variable system with a vft yeah, so there are three pumps working and by the by the way there i have used three vfts but it could be one vft work like that's used to operate three motors also so now what what we can do is like with three pump the three pumps working then we, we can work operate these pumps at 995 around 1000 rpm and it should be able to provide you this 66 percent uh, uh, required water demand but now by because you are changing the speed of these uh, pumps even if you are working with three pumps now uh, to, uh, uh, then what you can do is like you basically reduce the power consumption to 30 percent so you have nearly like 36 uh, th nearly uh, 35 36 percent energy saving just at that instance so the second example is of a fan. So it's a let's say you have a, a tunnel ventilation system. So this example is of a tunnel ventilation system in India that um, um, like ABB installed the uh, so installed the ventilation system in. So uh, so the the tunnels are not always filled with uh, traffic or a lot of vehicles. So there are peak hours, off peak hours where where these tunnels work. So assume that there is only 30 percent uh, uh, um, rated traffic inside the uh, inside the tunnel so it's the same thing now what you can do is like instead of like having this fixed speed system uh, operating like at the rated speed all the time which consumes 100 percent energy there so if you had uh, you could basically with a vft system you could operate the fan at 450 rpm uh, so to give you this 30% flow airflow and you can see the dramatic difference in the power consumption so you are only using like around 3% of your 3% uh, uh, energy um, so it's really so what I so if in this centrifugal system it's really really it's a no-brainer I would say like that you use you, we should be going to VFT systems um, there's I mean there, we can talk talk about some drawbacks of having VFTs, but I think the, the the benefits of it outweighs the drawbacks uh, drawbacks um, uh, by a significant margin. So this is one example. So I want to go to another example. So now I want to include different motor topologies uh, within. The, so now, if all the systems now we in the first slide we talk about going from a fixed speed to a variable speed. Now I want to talk more about if you had variable speed on all the systems and uh, uh, you use different motor topologies that uh, Deepak uh, G that who, who talked about before, you have like this induction machine um, uh, and um, you have the synchronous reluctance machines that we talked about, we can go to like IE4, IE5, the ABB already produces this as IE4, IE5, both the categories. And then we also have this ferrite permanent magnet assisted synchronous reluctance machines which doesn't go above ie5 uh, so we also produce these motors uh, so all these three motor categories if we use try to compare this together so all of these are running with this acs 850 vft that from abb um, and what so some of the assumptions here is like the motors are operating at so if you look at so at 100 percent load we are operating 20% of the time, 75% load, we are 40%, 50%, so 25% load, we are operating for 30% 30 30 of the time. So there are, so basically it creates a load, 
so what we have we have this uh, load cycle uh, for this different motor mo different uh, motor drive packages here and all these motors as you uh, like work with the sensorless control mode and all with this ACS 850 drive you can basically identify the parameters automatically so you don't need like it's a very easy installation and uh, ease of use so basically you just press a button and then you the drives will be intelligent enough to identify which motor it is uh, and which uh, and all the motor parameters required are automatically identified by this drive so i'm taking an example of 11 kilowatt motor here and, and you can see the efficiencies the, the relative efficiency of the motors there but what is and now i'm using two, two different types of pumps here so one is the positive displacement pump to start with and you can see that the total energy consumption per year um, decreases as you go to a high efficiency machine so i mean how much energy is saved how much cost is saved and it will depend upon the cost of energy at that location but in general in uh, in four to five years you should be able to get a payback for using a more efficient motor in this system and the same is true with the centrifugal system so you so centrifugal pumps that you would do the same like you would uh, um, reduce the amount of energy uses uh, for the same system same load cycle by using a more efficient motor even with a vft so and it will give you a payback period in four to five years <laughs> so now i want to move to another aspect of uh, saving energy and uh, Deepak Ji talked about it it's the regenerative braking part of it and so this is more common in like centrifuge applications and uh, the centrifuge applications are mainly used for like if you are for example separation of uh, sugar in sugar mills you use this um, uh, centrifuge, uh, centrifuges and also in milk and dairy production you use the centrifuges it can and this um, for mining waste hoist um and also you can this regenerative braking becomes important and also for the cable car uh, and ski lifts those are also um, some of the uh, area or some of the industries that you will use this regenerative regenerative braking features and the idea here of using regenerative is basically for, for all this application is basically um so you are trying to get the energy back during the uh, during the deceleration period or deceleration period of um, um, deceleration period of this uh, applications and it's actually of course there is this energy saving uh, because of this um, uh, getting this energy back to the uh, energy ba um, energy back to the grid but of the more important uh, thing more important um, advantage i will talk about is uh, if you use this VFTs to do this uh, regenerative braking, you are actually increasing the productivity of this, uh, uh, increasing the productivity productivity of the system, but also uh, reducing the maintenance need of the systems. And I'll talk a little bit in the in the later slides about this. So, so what happens is like um, so using the VFT like so, so I talked about uh, this uh, regenerative braking, but also like what, what when you use a VFT system you also have better control on your speed and torque. Basically, what it means for, on an industry side is you have better quality and you you have less waste of material. Because what happens is if you have use a uh, induction machine which is directly connected to a uh, to a line. As the load in, load increases or decreases, your slip will change, and that would mean that your speed of your rotor, actually the end application, would change. So that would not bring you a good consistency on your on your quality, and also you are wasting material there. So that's that's that added, and just not just the energy side, but it's also on the um, quality and the quality side that you uh, have a benefit there. So. The other advantage is that you can really like have some 
like uh, emergency operations you can over or over speed the system so uh, for example in a uh, in a SVAC system if you really need required like uh, for once once like you know, for one hour a day you needed like a really high airflow for example you could over speed the system uh, over over speed the system for a short time and get uh, get this emergency need um, fulfilled and also these drives are able to handle weak networks so changes in uh, voltage and frequencies doesn't affect uh, your end applications because uh, because you have a drive interface and talking about the it reduces the maintenance uh, because you are not having this frequent start and stops but also like uh, you are uh, so you are also reducing the stresses on the gearboxes so because you can do a soft start here and when talking about this regenerative braking, if you are braking electrically, so you are actually reducing the stresses on your mechanical brakes because all this, for example, centrifuges, um, uh, hoist, it will need brakes, like mechanical brakes also. So you are basically extending the life of your mechanical components by using, uh, using a drive in those applications. Um, Drives also like this VFT is like the also provide you ad, added intelligence and safety features for, and it can be uh, depending upon which drive uh, you are using um, you you can basically add certain sort of safety features that's related to that specific uh, application or industry need. For example, uh, what I saw in the picture on the right is uh, is a drive that's made specifically for um, SVAC application and you can see um, uh, so, sorry a uh, pumping application and you can see the um, by the picture here like uh, it has a water drop there so it's it's meant for uh, pumping applications so in this case uh, in this drive for example you can add it has some intelligence inside so you don't need a separate flow sensor to flow to um, uh, <clears throat> to know your flow rates, uh, uh, flow rates on your pipe for example the drive can provide you that data and also like it has intelligence inside that it will always uh, make sure that it's not stressing your pipes and the pump system so that your life lifetime of your uh, piping and the pump is actually not reduced because uh, uh, not reduced because of ex this additional uh, pressure fix and there are and we have like uh, we have like uh, drives for um, SVAC applications, and there, like for for a building and for building hospitals, uh, like these kinds of drives are used. And where there you have this um, features or intelligence that if you if there is if it detects fire, uh, for example, there's a, a lot of smoke or there's a fire in your bu building, then you can the drive will drive is able to spin the fan in opposite direction at, uh, and then try to extract the smoke out of the building so that uh, the, so that people are safe inside or like try to minimize the damage because of the uh, damage because that would be caused by a fire for example so it tries to so specific safety features and intelligence could be added to these drives And here, um, these are like some applications, two applications I uh, use from a sugar mill, um, so that AVB has installed. And just to show you, like these are some cases that AVB worked on and, um, and give you like some specific numbers here. Um, so the first one is this Al Kelly's uh, sugar mill in UAE. Um, so, so they had an old system and they re re in their centrifuges, um, and um, so what ABB did was like basically uh, replace those um, centrifuges uh, by with ABB motors and VFT. And, in the, and I think the main advantage there, uh, as I talked about before, is this increase in productivity. So because of this new system, and uh, you could you could accelerate and decelerate much faster than the old centrifuges. So what it meant. For the customer was that the number of cycle that the centrifuges can run increased from 24 to 30 per hour so that's about 25 percent uh, uh, 
uh, increase in your productivity uh, going from uh, uh, so uh, going from this uh, old system to a new system. In terms of energy saving, you already it was around 22 percent of 20 percent in 22 percent energy saving going from this old system to a new system on this in this super mill plant. And we have cases uh, like different. We have uh, used uh, uh, different uh, these VFD systems in the sugar mills in Pakistan also, and this is one of them. Uh, it's this Mirpukas uh, sugar mills in Pakistan there. Uh, so we so the old system of sugar mills they normally use the steam turbines to cross uh, the for, for the crosser applications where you cross the sugar canes. So the, it was replaced by uh, this ABB motors and drives, and what they saw dramatic, like a 40% uh, reduction in the energy saving um, in this plant because of this replacement. And this is now like, becoming more, very, more and more popular in sugar mill, and then we are having a lot of different sugar mills coming to us, and we're trying to replace their old system with the new ABB system uh, all over the world, basically. Yeah, so these are all the good things I, t I tell about um, uh, using DFTs. But what are the effects that we have to be aware of? These are, and when I say aware of, I mean these are not not showstoppers. Uh, so, so showstoppers not to use uh, uh, the VFT, but we, we have to be aware that these problems exist and there are solutions, different solutions there that can solve this problem. Uh, and uh, it depends upon, uh, and I'll talk a little bit in the next slide here uh, about these uh, solutions, but let's look into the problem. So Deepak, you already mentioned about uh, how a VFT works there. So you have basically a rectifier uh, converting AC to DC, and then you, are, uh, you have an inverter section that converts your DC signal to the DC signal to the AC. So when this conversion from DC to, so AC to DC happens, so you have your ideal grid supply current that's, go, that's going in, but a rectifier is not a, such a good conversion, like a, a diode bridge rectifier is not a, such a good conversion device, I would say. Um, so if you take a six pulse rectifier, your waveform, like your like purely sinusoidal waveform will look more like this black, what you see in the black curve with two different, two like a toothed or like a sawtooth kind of uh, a waveform. Uh, so it has a lot of harmonics, and uh, it's like, uh, and if and what you could basically, um, so because of this, like it's in the range of 90% harmonics, um, so you would add basically a, a lot of additional peaks of current to your system. If, for example, your transformer, your switches, um, and circuit breakers, you would add a lot of additional load to this because of these harmonics. Um, so basically what could happen, basically because of this added peaks of your harmonics, you would overheat, you could overheat your transformer cables, circuit breakers, um, uh, even motors, other motors that's on the same line. Uh, you could have nu nuisance trip because of added heating. And if you have other sensitive electronics around that operation, then you might basically trip them, um, your electronics. Uh, um, and also you could have issues with your lights um, because of this kind of harmonics. In, so depends upon how how big the system is. It, it, it depends on a lot of different factors. Not So it's not very, as simple as saying, okay, this, this, this effect is there, but what the, uh, what the end effect of this using this uh, uh, diode rectifier would be, it, it depends on a lot of different factors, not just, uh, so, it, so it depends on the not, not different loads that you have. And so I, I'll talk a little, little bit in the next slide. So we talked about the problem. What uh, so you have this big harmonic. So like, um, so you, you, in the in the first column, what you see like you see have the six pulse VFT, and if you use no like mitigation techniques, just 
uh, as the diet rectifier only, then your harmonics, typical harmonics is like 90 to 120 percent. Um, so it's a pretty high harmonic comp uh, content. It's not really recommended, but really, um, if you're using just one drive, let's say a 7.5 kilowatt drive in your in one of your motors, I don't think it matters a lot because the uh, you could use it even without anything. So even by standards, like if you are below uh, 7.5 kilowatts of power rating, normally the it's not required by any uh, at least here in the U.S. and also in Europe. You are not uh, required to put any mitigation uh, to that uh, to that drive. So it's up to the customer if they want to do it or not. But if you go to higher power and if you are using more number of drives, th then there would be a requirement from the grid to do that. And also, it's on the best interest of the customer itself to do it because it's it's affecting his or her other system. So the most common way of mitigating this issue uh, of uh, uh, effect, this harmonics effect uh, on the grid side is just using this 5% or 3% chokes, what we call the reactors or chokes that's are, that are used, which reduces the harmonic to an acceptable level. And most of the, uh, this is also a cheaper option uh, because cost is a, always, I mean, there are a lot of different uh, ways of, uh, um, addressing these issues, but this is one of the cheapest options that's there out there, and it's commonly used in most of these fan pumps and compressor applications. And but if you are using larger motors and it's a larger system, maybe the uh, the grid operator would want you to have even uh, uh, have even more mitigations. So you want to go to active uh, front end. If you, for example. You could go to this uh, multi uh, multi pulse VFT, so where you are using this 12 pulse or 18 pulse <coughs> uh, rectifier, rectifiers. So there are different. So it's all the there are different ways of mitigating this. It's just a matter of cost and and as you know, like customers would only do it if it's they are required to do it. So they do. So if the grid really asks them that you have to make your harmonics to let's say below five percent then they have to do it so uh, so they will use active front end for example but if they are not required by the uh, some standards or uh, the grid then normally you would go for the cheapest option there and uh, as i said this reactor is one of the uh, most common app common way of um, mitigating this issue Um, so th that's we went to the grid side, but what are the effects on the motor side? Uh, so, and Deepak, you also talked about this a, a little bit uh, b uh, before. So basically, we are talking about insulation stress and the bearing uh, bearing currents. So, uh, as Deepak mentioned, we are using while doing this inversion side. So when going from DC to AC now, uh, that's when effect when the when the motor is affected. So we are using this really high uh, pulse width modulation, which is like basically switching, uh, <clears throat> like having this short square wave pulses, as you see in this figure, which is operating in the range, mostly in the range of uh, four to eight kilohertz in most industrial applications. So what this does is basically you have this one effect is due to the rise time of this uh, IGBT devices that's used in the drive, but the other is because of the Difference so difference in the impedance between the between this drive and on the motor side because our motor is basically a very high uh, has a high impedance and then you have a transmission line and the uh, transmission line and the drive which has a low impedance so basically if you send a fast switching pulse to this uh, motor uh, which has high impedance there's a uh, like in a transmission line you have a reflection of the wave. So what it does is, if this, this because of this reflection of the wave, what you would see is like your voltage, uh, what the motor sees can be more than two times, or more than two times the peak of the DC bus voltage, uh, DC bus voltage, or the peak of your uh, supply basically. So that would in stress your insulation because, and it's not a immediate failure, but it would slowly because of this partial discharges you will create prematurely uh, fail the motor and then you so you need to be aware 
that you need to have an inverter ready motor to really um, uh, to use to, to use it with a drive so that you have a lifetime that's rated from so so that the lifetime that's rated by the um, manufacturer can be achieved otherwise it might fail earlier regarding the bearing current it's the same thing so uh, wh what happens is basically like now if you had a sinusoidal waveform um, then any at any instance of time a sinusoidal waveform the sum of the instantaneous sum of all the voltages and current is zero so, so, so at a certain extent that all it's the instantaneous sum is always zero but when you are using this square wave uh, pulses then you basically have this common mode world because this vector sum is not zero anymore and then you have this uh, common mode voltage that's there and then you because it's switching at like four to eight kilohertz then you have this capacitive effect between the stator and the rotor which creates the because of this high it's basically a very high frequency um, signal that's flowing through your capacitor and so then you have a current flowing through your uh, from the rotor to the uh, stator to the rotor and through the shaft and through the bearing and then this would create a premature failure of the bearing so this is the two effects really like uh, for the motor and I, what i saw here is basically on the left so you can see a uh, winding which like deteriorates slowly and then after a certain time then you you have this uh, so, so basically it cuts, creates a short circuit you know but it develops not at an instant but it develops with a certain time span and the second picture i have here is basically how the bearing is damaged uh, so because of the current so because of this bearing so because of this um, uh, current flow through the uh, from the stator to the rotor you would have a differential on your voltage on the bearing because bearing has a like of course two sides then you have the ball the bearing balls but also insulation flame so what it creates is this because there's a voltage between the two sides or the potential difference between the two sides you have this edm or the electrical discharge uh, machining effect that's going on and so it's basically like welding so you you had a so you basically create this uh, small spark and what it creates on the bearing is basically like a what we call a fluting of the bearing rest so basically it damages the bearing um, bearing in the long run so you you will have premature failure, failures of your bearing also so we are aware of this and it's and we have different ways of solving these issues within ABB and it's also as I said depends upon the size of the size of the motor how long your cable is that's going from the drive to the motor so I would really say um, and uh, so how you mitigate is really like you need to look like it's case by case mostly and there are standards where you can see where they mention okay if you have a certain a certain length of cable you, you can use a certain method so uh, so some of this as I uh, here I, I mean just as an example here for the insulation side um, so we could use basically common word filtering there um, so that's one one so I think it, you don't need to use for all the applications but for some applications there and yeah and here you can see like in some motors we use or certain sizes of motor we use special insulation not the standard insulation so that to make that um, issue issue of insulation stress uh, less of an issue and then we are also trying to uh, uh, so for the bearing current like we are trying to use insulated bearings in some of our products and also we uh, try to use uh, ceramic if the customer really requires it we can use ceramic bearings uh, and also, there are ways like uh, you, you can ground the shaft. So I would say there are different ways of mitigating. Uh, so there are, so what I wanted to highlight is basically there are more benefits to using a VF, VFT than uh, the drawbacks. And some of the drawbacks, it's a well-known issue of the, the drawbacks are a well-known issue and it can be mitigated using different um, methods. And 
be based on the customer's uh, requirement. So I would like to uh, summarize my presentation here. So as I said, VFT can really save us significant amount of energy. It's not only the variable speed operation, but it's also the reduced maintenance and producing better quality and increasing productivity. And what we are seeing is, and, and because of this, I think what we are seeing is basically in the industry are trained towards more and more VFT. So if you had thought 20 years, years ago, I mean, maybe the VFT was, the use of VFT was like really like non-existent or like very low. Now what we see is any new installation, like 50% of the motors now are installed using a VFT and that's, a, and the trend is increasing. Um, so modern VFT is not only like, so it, really provides has the ease of installation so you can so you don't need to like program things or you basically press a button it will identify your motor all the parameters of the motor uh, and it it knows how to run the motor uh, so it has so it's really easy to install um, it has intelligence um, and also provides improved safety which i talked about so depending upon what safety level you require you can do that and and we had and most of these VFTs are now provided for different applications tailored to a different applications or different solutions um, industrial solutions so it can so it meets that industry's grid code requirement or the country standards um, and it also provides all the interfaces uh, for uh, interfaces required for that application so that it can produce your optimum give you an optimum performance so that's uh, the uh, and and the and the last I think what I want to say is like now I think now we had this motor and the drive and the, as the VFT has different units and the trend now is towards going towards the integration of this motor and the VFT together. Um, so you see it in the picture like what uh, one of our products, uh, which is the EC what we call the EC titanium integrated motor drives. So you have a motor uh, and the drive together and this actually is going towards even more uh, ease of installation um, because the motor knows the drive knows exactly what the motor which motor is used you are re it's really e easy to hook up to the uh, main power supply because you just have three wires connected then you are done and it also saves a lot of space basically so this is what what I wanted to present. So uh, thank you for listening, uh, and let's uh, all try to be more energy efficient. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and if you have any other questions, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, sir. So for the presentation, I think. We have gone through the case study and that has a clear picture of our understanding also. So I have some question over here. Let me... so this question is a bit generic. What is the return on investment if existing form are retrofitted with BFD? In how many years the invested amount will be paid back? Can you say something about this? Oh yeah, sure. Um... So, um, so it really, I mean, it really depends upon the um, uh, de depends of the depends upon the application, right? So, um, and also uh, sizes of what sizes is. But generally, I mean, so as I said, like if it's a centrifugal system, like a centrifugal pan and, uh, pan and pump application, and if you are using it partial load most of the time, it could even be one 1.5 years. So it doesn't really have you. I mean, there are cases where you can, within one year, you are getting the payback. So, but it really, uh, but uh, especially, uh, so I would like to stress, like uh, if it's a centrifugal application, I don't think you need to even ask that question. You, you can directly go to the uh, VFT application within a year, you should be able to do, get your return, on your return on your investment. So, um, but, but it's not only this, um, 
uh, like energy saving, but it's also like other things that's important that would reduce your cost basically. So of course, energy saving is the direct uh, direct return you see, but in terms of your, you, you need to also calculate your productivity and your uh, uh, like increase your productivity and quality also like in uh, when, when you are factoring in. So so I, I, so to make it um, to make it uh, I think it's like um, some applications it will be one year and for some other applications it might be longer because it really depends upon where you are using it so you need to be, do a case-by-case -case study yeah okay thank you sir I have another question here so what are the range of BFP code of the ABB manufacturing uh, it's, it can goes to up to megawatts so it's i would say like um i mean we provide what the customer asks basically so but the common ones um so um, which are basically what we call the stock type so the, the general purpose stock type uh, drives uh, we go to like a few megawatts That's so i have yeah. another question, sir. something similar to this so what is the minimum size of motor to use for BFP? Uh, there is no minimum size, I would say, um, because if you look into, um, actually it's very common in smaller motors. So if you look at your sm small, uh, so like Deepak Z talked about the BLDC motors. Uh, so you can see it in most of the applications now is like, um, you can you can take your washing machine or take your uh, fan for ventilation. Nowadays, it's very very common that you use this um, um, BLDC or it's basically a, a variable speed drive. So uh, there there is really no not a minimum size. Um, but what is the most uh, if you want to know like uh, what's the most common size industrial size that we sell to? Uh, it would be in the range of uh, 7.5 7 uh, to 15 kilowatts, or I would say even 22 kilowatts. Yeah, that would be very common. Okay, thank you, sir. Your answer. So I have a another question. Yeah. With the use of BFD, operational of the wasted energy uh, can be used or reduced. But uh, it can still run it under capacity or uh, under utilization. Do you have any uh, idea of reduced capacity? There is, uh, you can maybe there will be the reduced capacity. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. Sorry. Can you please repeat? Yes, a question is a type one. So, with the use of BRP, hmm? uh, operational of the wasted energy uh, can be used. Yeah. Wasted energy can be used, but uh, efficiency uh, can be, but it can still run it under capacity. Or uh, the, the motor system or the all system will be un, under utilization because if the uh, speed reduced, uh, there is the potential of saving the power, but the capacity will be under utilized. So, what do you say on that? Oh, okay. 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 Uh, so normally for uh, yeah I, I do thank you uh, thank you for clarifying that so normally I think I, I don't call it uh, under utilization because normally for a system it's rated for the worst case scenario so or I would say all the anything is rated for the worst case scenario but you are not using this worst case scenario all the time so so you are rating it for like 100% load but it's for most of the application what you are doing is not using this 100 percent you so in in i think i would say like 90 percent of the applications you would see that the uh the, it's like in the range 50 to 70 percent is the nominal load in most of the cases so this um 100 percent load is only used at a certain time so i don't call it underutilization so i mean you can take any examples right so let's take a, a cable car. I, I, I think we have it in our mountains in Nepal. We have these cable cars. I mean, do you think this is always filled with people? Because let's say in the morning, like there will be a lot of crowd going up the hill. 
so you'd use 100 percent but that's two hours of a day then all the other rest of the day you will have maybe like 50 percent of the people going up the hill so basically it's not underutilized and you are you are basically saving energy uh, basically saving save, saving energy so, so that you are only you only, only using what you need basically yeah so thank you sir we have another question so what percentage of energy saving can we achieve in submersible water form of water uh, it really depends upon the so uh, submersible water pumps. It can be two types. One is uh, for the centrifugal. So it can be centrifugal type. Um, uh, so if it's a centrifugal type, we, as I showed that it's a cubic function. So um, for so okay, let me put it this way. So you have a submersible pump, and uh, you have to fill a certain water tank, um, uh, and uh, so normally if you had an on-off system. Then you would run it, and if the water fills in, then it will switch off. Let's say it takes one hour to do that, right? Uh, or one, hour, one hour to uh, lift the water from this uh, with the pump in one hour, and then the system switches up. So you are using one hour of full energy, uh, full power. So if I had the time, so I could use I could use a, a variable speed pump. Like now I'm using a variable speed pump. I ha I could fill that water in two hours right uh with a variable speed pump uh at 50 percent uh, uh like 50 percent flow rate in, uh, then my energy saving will be much higher if i do that if i had the time to do that for example so i would say it's really really significant benefit if you if you move from uh fixed speed to the variable speed there yeah so you can calculate it's a it's a uh, cubic function so if you had 50 percent reduction you would see a significant benefit there yeah Okay, thank you very much, sir, for the presentation. Really, you provided us with the diagnostic information regarding this industrial application. Okay, so excuse me for me. So, uh, one question can you elaborate more on the impact of VFD and deep connected application? Excuse me, sir. Uh, sorry. Can you elaborate more? The impact of VFD on grid connected application. Uh, so, if I understand your question uh, correctly, um, so you want me? Uh, so you are talking about um, uh, impact of VFD on the grid app grid. I'm sorry, I, I'm not hearing you very clearly here. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Just uh, it is an elaborating type question. Can you elaborate more on the impact of VFD on grid connected application? Ah, okay. <clears throat> Yes, so thank you. Thanks. Um, so I, as, as I talked in this slide, so so basically, um, as I said, I mean, so most of these VFTs is a six pulse rectifier, and um, so six. So as I said, like the six pulse rectifier, like I mean, the, you can see like. This it has a huge like a lot of amount of uh, harmonics. So, so basically, when you're so, so if you want to know like how to like so I'm talking about the problem of uh, overheating. I think one of the main, main I think from the grid side, I would say the main impact would be this overheating of your <clears throat> uh, transformers and cables. So I think that would be one of the main um uh, uh, main problem i think that you, that can be created uh, b because of the vft connection if you don't have the right mitigation <clears throat> so so this is basically like i think so it's basically the uh, it's uh, so, so there are two phenomena one is the i square r losses because you are basically because you are adding another like if this is 90 percent harmonics then you are basically doing this i square r that's uh, that's so your your I square R increase uh, the losses increases a lot. So it's because it's 90% overload. I would say uh, if 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 that bad, right? If if there's no mitigation, then it's a lot of uh, load to your uh, to your transformer. If let's say you had, for example, in an industry you had like 
100 PFT is there, and like uh, rating at a megawatt, is there, so total power around a megawatt. Basically, it means that you you are loading your transformer to like almost two times that. So if, if that uh, that transformer was rated at one megawatt to provide that industry, the real load will be in in the range of almost two times there. Um, so that's one way. This is the I square R loss, but then harmonics is also like created at higher frequencies. So you are also creating <clears throat> more AC losses. Um, uh, so, so more uh, frequency related AC losses, both on your conductors, uh, on your trans for example, on the transformer, on, the, on your uh, on your um, uh, transmission line. Uh, so because you have, if you are a high, higher frequency, you are not accounting for the added, added uh, skin skin effect losses there, right? So uh, so uh, so from the grid side, I would be more concerned about that that mostly the transformer and the related uh, circuit breakers that's used with the transformer. Yeah. Does does that answer your question, or like if you have anything more specific, I, I would be uh, willing to answer. Sure. Okay, thank you, sir. Actually, it has a question from the participant. Hopefully, yeah, I mean, and yeah, you can always uh, tr if you have uh, like more questions, you could always email to me. Uh, I'll be willing to answer that. Yeah, sure. Okay, sure, sure. Sir. Okay, we have some question uh, still left here, but we are coming at the end of uh, our session, so we'll try to address the question from email to our participant. So I'm going to conclude the session. <clears throat> so with this, I would like to conclude. Thank you everyone for joining and attending the session in this hard hitting time of COVID-19. Thank you presenters for your informative uh, and interesting presentation. Thank you Omar and uh, Wahab for your technical support and thank you Omar for being here and all the presenters. Presentation will be available on SARC Energy Center oh, yeah. website www.sarcenergy.org very shortly. We would love to hear from you any suggestion and comment for further improvement because any suggested topic of our of your interest for future webinar. We'll be signing out. Thank you again for joining us today and looking forward to see you next time. Bye bye.